So hi, welcome back to uh, our last two sessions of uh, Fresh Produce India Live here. Uh, I'm in London. It's uh, quarter past 12, uh, just after midday. It's quarter to five in Mumbai, and it's uh, quarter past nine over in Melbourne. Uh, and we're now uh, on the home straight. We've got uh, the next 45 minutes where we're going to talk uh, and focus on two uh, case studies. Um, we'll hear in due course uh, from the Netherlands, but first we're going to focus on what's happening in Italy and look at the uh, way in which Italian apples uh, in particular have made huge inroads into the market in India over the last number of years. I'm going to be joined in a minute by Nicola Zanotelli, who's led the export charge into uh, India uh, at From, uh, uh, Italian uh, apples from the Italian Alps. And he's joined by Bo Higgins uh, from uh, uh, Fromm's advertising agency, Wordsmith, to talk uh, with me about what uh, uh, Italy has been doing in particular to grow their market uh, share in uh, India. We'll hear from them both uh, in a moment after a short presentation that they've prepared for us here today. Welcome to the presentation of Marketing Italian Apples to Indian Consumers, done by the company From Italian Alps. I am Nicola Zanotelli, Director of From Italian Alps, and together with me, you'll hear the voice of Paul Lamar Higgins, CEO of the advertising company Wordsmith. Let's now have a look at the market entry and the keys to success which have accompanied the path in marketing our apples into the Indian subcontinent. From Italian Alps was founded in July 2009 by the three main Italian apple producers, notably VIP, Valdenosta, Apot and Fog. These world famous producers account approximately for 75% of, of the Italian production, which is about 1.5 billion tons of premium fresh apples. The new marketing entity from was appointed for a long term approach into the Indian market. A single coordination would provide greater benefit both for the supplier and selected importers. The idea is to possibly match stability of importers ensured by the stability of a supplier. The key to success of marketing from Italian apples into the Indian market are for sure looking at the continuous availability over an extremely long period for a very large, highly standardized, superior quality apples in fact, from Italian offer can count on more than 30 different varieties, both standard and club varieties. On the other side of the value chain, it is important to understand which are the market acceptance keys to Indian consumers, both in organoleptic and optic terms. We should bear in mind that the Indian consumer is used to taste incredibly flavor fruits. Just think about the Indian mangoes, bananas, and any additional homegrown fruit. Apples growing in the from area of production, the Italian Alps, offer a richly flavored product with a natural shininess that requires no vaccine, a perfect match to Indian expectations for quality and safe products. This is the perfect answer to our partners and final consumer expectation for fruit, natural, richly flavored, accessible in volume and of superior quality. After From Italian Apps could reach a satisfactory market penetration with the stability of sales over a period of some years, it became necessary to invest in a pan-India marketing campaign. The European funds were of course a great chance to increase the visibility of our value up to the end consumer. The target being to enrich our efforts communicating now to the broader public in order to generate brand preference, highlighting the specific selling proposition of From Italian Arts. This allows me to introduce you to the marketing strategy and activities developed by our partner Wordsmith on the Indian subcontinent. Nicola, thanks for the kind introduction. Really appreciate the nice words. Before we jump into the actual campaign, I'd like to take a minute to look at the strategy and where the ideation for all of this came from. So the idea of terroir, 
and the naturalness, one of Frum's key insights, is something that we really built on, with that origin story in the Alps being visually translated into something the consumer could immediately identify with that was directly linked with the fruit. And then on top of that, that reason to believe not waxed, underlining and highlighting the naturalness and helpfulness of the apple was put in as a stamp to reinforce what you can actually see with the fruit itself. The campaign as a lucky draw campaign was designed to pull people into the stores, attract them to the tasting events, get them interacting with the brand, sampling the fruit, and of course purchasing it. But the first step was to get the word out. On mass media, radio really did our heavy lifting. We were on air for three weeks in three cities with a total of 1,350 spots aired, 450 per city, and generated some really significant GRPs. We backed this up with social media where we used a lot of visual support, the hype and excitement around the campaign, pictures of smiling consumers, and paired that with original content for the food and the other ways that you can use apples to integrate that health and goodness into your lifestyle. Our retail partner was an important choice for us and working with Big Bazaar, part of the future group, was a great choice. They're very forward looking like most Indian retailers and we worked with them for 196 days of sampling across 21 stores in Mumbai, Bangalore and Delhi creating a really effective connection with the consumer. Basically, the warm response and the general enthusiasm that we witnessed with consumers showed that the brand was connecting and that we were getting traction. In a fully branded environment where we had our teams on the ground branding on the location as well as special promotional packaging. In conjunction with that packaging, we also had a significant amount of collateral material that we distributed to consumers, including original recipe content and a recipe book, informational flyer, and of course, the form that allowed them to enter our lucky draw for the trip to the Italian Alps. When we take a look at the results, you can see that we really generated some meaningful impact. Across the three cities, we sold nearly 7,500 kilos of fruit at the promotional days, as well as generating over 3,000 promotional entries and moving a fair number of our promotional six-pack boxes. However, just the numbers really don't show everything. Because in this business, what matters is change in perception and how you affect the way the consumer views your brand. So widespread consumer recognition of Italy, of that origin story as a symbol of quality, and also addressing what's a big challenge for us in the Indian market that quality is really about flavor and not a dark red color, backing that up with enhanced awareness of the not wax benefit. And of course, building that relationship with our retailer partner, Big Bazaar, which wants to do things again next year on an even bigger scale. From began the exploration of India in FA 2010 with small steps, gathering market insights and understanding logistics and product related challenges and expectations. The best recorded marketing year for Italian fruits, as of today, is the season 2019, when the Italian produce was recognized and preferred across a broad swath of India. Let's not forget that there are several external factors influencing the buying habits of this market, which is seeing the entry of more origins compared to before, when it was basically just the US, China and the Southern Hemisphere. This created some confusion to clients who had a harder time understanding the real quality of products from different origins and the price they are paying for this. Additional factors as exchange rate, transit time, shelf life, which became more important as clients understand how necessary it is to invest not just in products but in brands that can survive and thrive in the Indian market despite its recurring fluctuations. Thanks for that assessment, Nicola. This is Bo again. Of course, once you've built up a strong presence with uh, the importers and also in the consumer's mind, you've really got to keep reinforcing that and sustain your visibility. And one of the
the tools that we've used extensively to do this in India's sponsorship, certainly here at Fresh Produce India this year and last year. Also with uh, the Pinkathon, which is a very interesting women's marathon held across India, where we had the privilege of being a sponsor this year. And in conjunction with a really strong presence with influencer marketing, got a lot of traction and really also felt we contributed to a good cause. When I'm asked to assess the potential of the India market, I usually invite my counterpart to take a plane with me and see what incredible India really means. Population size, growth, age, and fruit consumptions are such that we can't hardly calculate, but easily understand its long-term potential. What becomes increasingly clear is the market needs more structure, professional players on both sides who add value to products and not just sell, making sure the investments by both supplier and importer are secured. Success depends on a careful selection of partners, well thought out preparation in terms of business security, and a good understanding of the insights and typologies of markets. Yes, there are many markets in India. India has the possibility to give everyone a chance to be successful, but also can hurt if sales are not well guided and thought of, if processes are not extremely detailed. Lastly, fruit is a face-to-face -face business, so the presence on the ground and having neutral partner eyes is strategic. Thanks a lot to the audience for listening to our presentation and to the entire FruitNet staff for having made Fresh Produce India 2020 come through. Uh, Nicola Bo, it's uh, thank you very much indeed for those very interesting comments you had to make there about the way you've been approaching the market in uh, in India. It's uh, clear that you've done a huge amount of work and some very effective work. But my my point to you would be, uh, Nicola, I'd say this to you first that you've had it easy. Uh, you've been going into a market where, on the one side, the Americans who've been dominated the market for so many years have had, uh, what, a tariff of 70% on their fruit, and uh, China, which has been a big supplier to the market over so many years, just hasn't been present for, it was banned from, from the market. So it couldn't have been an easier time for, for European apples to come in and for Italian apples to come in. What do you have to say to that? Well, first of all, good evening, Aang, and good morning to everybody. I'd say that calling it an easy task to develop a market in India well, it would be a bit reductive, but at the same time, what you're saying has partially true. Um, the, we are facing today a market which is actually uh, excluding uh, completely China from the games and which is actually negatively affecting the capabilities of the US to deploy their uh, capabilities. At the same time, I might uh, bring your attention to the fact that the um, growth of likelihood of Italia, in, towards Italian apples by the Indian consumer started before the introduction of the new tariffs, which means that uh, already before we were uh, understanding that the steps taken and other taken were good, positive, and to stay focused on. Now, if we talk about shocks, uh, well, let me confirm that shocks are always negatives for markets and suppliers. If you look at it as a whole, uh, I would say that the, what we are assisting at is actually destruction of valorization. What of value? What does it mean? We assist automatically to sometimes dramatic changes in the flow of goods and change in origins and obviously change in suppliers. Let's think about Russia. And I think that as from we've done our way through this happening. Now, when sharks like this happen, everyone has to restart everything again, with the unavoidable consequence being the destruction of value. As value and time, luckily for those who always focus on this, go along together. As we know in the world market, for every item, let's say especially in the fruit business, there are two different approaches of selling. One is selling and one is valorizing. So, the, you have to understand what are the values, the true values, which can lead your organization and your product to valorization. So when you have 
objective values in your hands, like, for example, in the case of Italian fruits to India, a, spe a specific taste, secured storable quality and planning cap capabilities, a shorter transit time, brands, then all these objectivities are actually the focus of the investment of the importers, which have to decide constantly where to put their money. And not to forget that this, this country, with regard to the import of apples, applies a 50% or 51% duty on top of this. So I guess that you do want to have your investment secured before you're taking your chances. Yeah. Now, the practicalities, though, I think what Nicola is saying about valorization and adding value, this is Bo Higgins, by the way, from Wordsmith Advertising. Uh, we have a very strong story uh, with the Italian apples themselves because the Indian consumer is looking for a more flavorful fruit. Uh, Indian fruits themselves, what they're used to with mangoes and everything, are so special uh, that compared to some of the apples that have been in the market, uh, especially our galas are very strong. And we combine that with the message of origin, the naturalness of the Italian Alps, and what the consumers can actually see and hold, which is that the apples aren't waxed. Uh, and visually converting that into a seal and a stamp that they see on all of our promotional materials gives them that reason to believe and to buy into that added value story and buy the fruit. Uh, and I think what we've seen that with the response consumers gave to our marketing efforts, and we've also seen it with the the uptake and the preference on the part of on the part of importers. And have you found, Bo, that uh, consumers have been surprised to know that uh, that that these apples are available from 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 your part of the world? Has that been a story you've had to tell as well? Well, I think when people hear Alps, a lot of people think skiing. Uh, but I think with the fruit and the way that we presented the history, uh, that consumers have been very open to that and have uh, have really listened to where where they're coming from and why that's the right place to get apples from in terms of being one of the best growing climates in the world. Mm. Now, Nicole, I was I was being a bit unfair to you. I know at the at the beginning, but uh, because I know you've put an awful lot of effort over many years uh, uh, of 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 being in India, you've travelled all over the country. Um, and you've got many excellent contacts with many, many people in the business. Um, but uh, that, that, that kind of uh, story that you've had to talk to uh, the importers about and presenting uh, uh, Italy and Europe as an alternative supply source to those traditional supply sources that the Indian market has been kind of grown up with, the uh, United States in particular, how easy or how difficult has that been for you? Surely in the beginning, we have been asked uh, by all the clients to replicate what they were used to. So basically to bring them a Washington fruit. Yeah. And of course, that was the main point, because then, you know, if we talk about values and uh, specificities of your products, then of course, you're not, once you start copying, well, you are the second. Uh, and therefore, the important thing here is to have explored farther than whatever is a pricing issue or a consumption pattern and so on, trying to bite into a mango and then understand what people would naturally, from the time they're growing as a child, are putting in their mouth. So if we are looking at India as a palais, as a uh, as consumer country, well, what they are used to by nature is much better than what we've been able to bring over the past. So therefore, we are talking today about a potential shift of between a gala and a red chief when we are talking about valorization of fruits. And of course, we are talking about uh, apples, which in general in the world uh, today, if you look at the northern hemisphere plantings, are going to be potentially very many. So if this is a reality and this is the uh, objective, well, what do we want from it is to be different, but I would say better, but different with a clear scope. Because if you have this in focus and then you are able to valorize, remember not today and now, but in the long term. The problem in the end, though, if we talk specifically about India and not today because of the current situation, because of the Indian pattern of ordering, which is a long distance ordering, well, in the end, the value is such 
once the money is in your account. And I guess many people who's listening are very well knowing what I'm saying. So transparency, correct commercial acting, business security, that is the key for the time to be and the only future I see for those origins which are always been stri striving for valorizing the work they are doing. And of course, to be, let's say, of an example even for growing origins, which are, of course, looking at us and trying to get always better and better. Mm -hmm. So in order not to lose the run, you love, you have to continue running. That's the only way. Well, uh, just, to, just to conclude this uh, part, uh, what are the particular challenges you're facing this year with, uh, in, you know, marketing in the times of COVID-19? Uh, where, where are you with that and, and what kind of uh, discussions have you been having with your importers uh, and, and in fact with the consumers then? Um, well, see, uh, in times like these, first of all, you uh, can very well judge who's whom inside and not in the outside. And that is a, a very clear learning point, not only for me, I guess, for everybody. At the same time, what we learn is, uh, well, we have been actually touching the right, uh, the right buttons in the past because we've been talking about naturality. We've been talking about an environment where our fruits are growing, which is totally natural. The, fruit, the water which we use for watering our fruits is coming from a glacier, which, by the way, in the Indian mentality and culture is an extremely important thing. Mm -hmm. The non-vaccine giving you an apple, which gives you the possibility to, ex to experience the same fruit as if it was collected from the tree. Well, I think these are values which are just un undoubtedly positive. And as of today, when we are talking about security of food, uh, safety of uh, uh, the produce that is uh, being handled, well, I think we were never doing anything wrong. Uh, Bo, do you want to add to that? I think basically from the consumer perspective, which is much more uh, where we operate, that consumers understand that that natural story uh, and that origin story with the Alps and with the glacier water really doesn't change because of COVID. Uh, COVID is much more of a human thing and an urban thing that isn't affecting us from a growing perspective. Okay, guys, uh, thank you very much indeed for presenting uh, the story of uh, your apples from the Italian Alps. Stick around for the uh, for the rest of this session where we're going to be talking about um, the Netherlands and how uh, Dutch uh, companies um, uh, are doing a huge amount of work in India to present their products um, uh, or rather their systems of, of uh, production uh, to ways in which uh, can really make a difference to the Indian uh, grower and ultimately, of course, to the Indian shopper. We're going to have uh, two short presentations, then we'll have a, a discussion as we've just had now with Nicole and Bo, but this time with uh, Jan Doldersum of Rijkswan and Pascal van Oers uh, from uh, VEK, an advisory uh, group. So we'll hear from both Jan and uh, Pascal with their presentations, and I'll come to them for a discussion. Hello everybody, welcome at this event and my presentation. My name is Pascal van Oers from VEK, a global operating company specialized in projects for protected cultivation of crops. The company VEK started in 1971. This picture shows you one of our first big projects, eight acres constructed in 1975 mechanical rolling benches and additional grow lights. Really first of its kind. For VEK, this project was the first overall project. We started by making a conceptual project design. Next step was to translate this design into an investment budget. And after financial approval, VEK made 10 documents to reach out to contractors and get the best value for money. And as of today, this is still what we do. We make plans with the client make economic calculations, find the best manufacturers and contractors for the project, and keep an eye on the project during construction. We only do protected cultivations project, always with the focus of creating a lean and mean green machine for the customer. VEK operates globally, 
and for different kind of organizations and companies. In 2011, India got on our radar. A large crop science company had planned a new breeding station and VEK was responsible for the high-tech RNA greenhouse. Along the project, we noticed the opportunities for protected cultivation in India. India is big, India is challenging too. Together with our partners of the Dutch consortium Hortitech India, we promote modern horticulture. A lot has changed since 2011. My opinion, subsidizing all these one acre projects was a waste of time and money. I'm pleased with the big projects that are currently under construction. The food and vegetable markets are changing. Traditional wholesalers will be replaced by modern marketeers who control production, sales and logistics. They create their own offtake agreements to be able to raise capital for greenhouse projects. Most of the work is still done by hand. This will change upcoming years. Food safety protocols will cause a shift to more mechanical product handling. In the following slides, I will go through some topics about what can be learned from others like VEK. Each project starts with an opportunity, an opportunity to earn money. It can be the introduction of a new kind of product or the implementation of new technologies to increase productivity. My takeaway is this. Make a good description of your idea and objectives. It will help you and others that get involved to keep focused along the way. Your compass. Next topic is about planning. Make sure you have a good overview of all the stages from design until your first harvest. Create clear milestones. You can't predict everything, but the planning provides you guidance. Be creative and try to stick to the original plan. When designing a greenhouse project, always keep the basics in mind. Water, light, nutrients, temperature and CO2. The crop is the boss, but the grower should be the manager of all these parameters. We promote flexibility. Flexibility to control the light. Flexibility to control the climate on crop level. But some things you can't control. An example is the outside temperature. Do not underestimate the consequences of your project location. Cheap family owned land might look attractive, but believe me, somehow it's always on the wrong spot. Focus on a site with cool nights. If nature gives you cool nights, you can allow your crops to have higher temperatures during the day. That can save you a lot of headaches and money. We also promote redundancy. Better safe than sorry. My final slide is about the use of cheap local labor forces. That sounds attractive, but if they don't know what to do or how to do, it will cost you a lot of money. Even more important, it might cause you issues later. We've seen it all. Forgotten bolts, wrong sequence of piping and cables, leaking. My takeaways, take time to prepare the execution phase. Arrange teams of workers with a smart group leader. Work with incentives. Be precise, but work hard. Registration, registration, registration. Especially on big projects, one supervisor can't remind every detail. And avoid a mess on site. Have good registration of all incoming goods and where they are dropped and clean up all the waste. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Don't hesitate to contact us. Everybody, uh, good afternoon. Uh, well, um, and we'll come back to you for uh, some uh, Q&A in a, in a moment. Um, I'd like to turn straight away to uh, what Jan Dolderson has to say um, from Rijksvan and then we'll join Jan in a, in a discussion as well. So let's see uh, Jan's presentation. Everybody, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining uh, the session for the Fresh Produce India webinar. Uh, my name is Jan Doltersum, a manager chain and retail for the company Rijkswaan. We are breeding, uh, developing, producing and selling vegetable seeds um, worldwide. <coughs> and in this presentation I want to focus on the Dutch solutions for the Indian horticulture. The spread of coronavirus affects all of us. The whole fresh produce industry, 
is highly impacted. It's good to state here that the Rijkswaan is doing their utmost to ensure a continued supply of seeds. We have posted this video Stronger Together last week on all our social media channels. Our activities in India. We established our company in 2011 with our headquarters in Bangalore. Two years ago we opened a new breeding station in Garakkahali. On the picture you see here Harry Singh, who is our managing director, and our new chain manager Ajit Bisoy. We have about 50 colleagues working for our Indian subsidiary. Our product portfolio for the Indian market. We have a typical Western product range with mainly fruit crops, so all kind of bell peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplants, and uh, various lettuce types with different colors, melons for domestic market and also for, for export, and of course open field crops like beetroot, brassicas, and gherkins, which is still our main product for the processing factories. The Food Tech India project. This was an Indian Dutch public private corporation which finished in January 2020. The Rijksvaan contribution to this project was twofold. First of all, of course, to provide good genetics, and secondly, to train and educate new farmers to this new technology. In this slide, I want to present to you the number of hectares and the protected cultivation in India. The total greenhouse acreage we estimate in about 25,000 hectares, from which one fifth, which is about 5,000 hectares, are for vegetables, and divided in 2,000 hectares for plastic house and 3,000 for net houses. The total hydroponic cultivation, so soilless, is limited with only 25 hectares, and the really high tech industry in India is also very limited with only 2.5 hectares in Noida with the Dutch uh, investor. So the uh, perspective also for the future we expect that especially the high tech will still be quite limited. The Rexwan solutions and services for India. I have highlighted four of them. The first one is to transfer the latest growing technology of high and mid tech horticulture in protected cultivation. We have trained so far more than 2,000 new growers in 15 states for protected cultivation, 5,000 growers in the gherkin industry and more than 25,000 growers in open fields. The first hydroponic growing technology for lettuce has been developed in Hyderabad for more than 150 acres to produce ready-to-eat salads and supplying to the IT industries such as Google. We also work in strong collaboration with the government department in each state to further development of center of excellence. The second service is to develop and train growers in order to adapt environmental friendly growing techniques to produce low residue vegetables. Rexwan develops varieties for net and poly houses to reduce the chemical use thus suitable for processing industries. This counts for instance for gherkins and for color industry. Gherkins is a very important market for, the, for India with more than 10 million tons annual production and directly attached 5000 farmers to these processing companies. With that India contributes to about 40% in the total gherkin production globally. The color industry is also important as India is a large exporter of natural colors for the food industry. Hot pepper is a good example and is the highest contributor for natural colors. The third service is to support exporters of fresh healthy vegetables from India to neighboring countries. You can think about sweet pepper, melons, but now also lettuces. 
to companies, to countries like Singapore, Dubai and Europe to en enhance the export for more than 40 growers. And we are training Indian farmers in Australia, Thailand and Europe and we are planned to train also in the future four to five growers every year outside of India. And the last service is developing linkages between growers and retail chains in the local domestic markets such as Lulu Group, The Future Group, Reliance, Metro, Bisque Basket and many more. And I'd like to finish my presentation with a summary with a future perspective which consists of four parts. India will stay an important market for all vegetable crops as well as protected cultivation and the government will play a crucial role in this. Government policies support the growth of vegetables for export markets. Labour challenges which we are facing will lead to mechanical cultivation in the future and therefore high tech crops will increase. We also expect an increase of already mentioned export of processing vegetables, the further development of the retail market in India to secure a year-round supply of safe food with a good shelf life and the further development of the quick service market. The second part is retail where we see two directions both online to offline as well as offline to online. Amazon Fresh, Walmart owned Flipkart, Bitbasket, Swiggy, Zamata have already en entered the fresh online market both for B2C as well as to the B2B online segment. Offline retailers are starting online ordering to compete with the online players. The third aspect is the fresh cut industry and we further expect their growth due to emphasis on convenience and healthy living. And the last point is consumer trends where we see snacking due to small family size, busy lifestyle, longer working hours, people will prefer to eat more light meals like salad bowls. Organic consumers will increase because of health, caring for nature and taste. The third part is the health and nutrition and lastly consumers are also demanding the traceability of the produce for a premium price. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and now it's time for a live Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, uh, and thank you, Pascal, for uh, your very interesting presentations that we've just uh, heard. They're all, uh, by, way, by, by the way, the whole proceedings of this uh, conference are going to be available for all of you to, to actually re relive if you want to. It'll be available for download uh, and uh, in, in due course, and we'll be writing to all of you, um, all 650 of you who've registered uh, for today's conference. But we're now coming to the last uh, part of our conference, and I'd like to spend a few minutes, if I may, talking to both Pascal and uh, Jan, who we've heard from just there, about uh, how they see uh, life uh, in India and what's, what they see the opportunities to be in India in future. And I think we've heard very clearly that, that um, the Netherlands as a, as a country, we heard this from uh, Ilse van Dijl right at the start of, uh, of, of our event today, see um, a relevance that uh, the Netherlands has uh, as uh, a relatively small country, but a huge producer uh, and a huge exporter, as well as a huge um, uh, bringer of, of innovation and insight and knowledge uh, to all parts of the world, including to here in India. And Jan, if I could come to you first, um, your, almost your penultimate slide, I think you said that you see all sorts of uh, opportunities in the India market to essentially respond to the demands that, that Indian consumers have at the end of the day and to deliver a, a better product to uh, the market is that is that the key challenge for you? How do you how do you deliver a better product to Indian shoppers? Uh, Jan, that's f for you. Uh, hello, everyone. 
can you i can't hear you and um yeah. indeed uh, the, the the question always for us is uh, how can we uh, come up with the right genetics before Okay. I think we're on a bad, a bad line. Perhaps I could just turn to Pascal while we try and sort that line problem out with you, Jan. Um, Pascal, the, the, you, you spoke about the uh, work that you're doing um, to bring uh, infrastructure, uh, um, glasshouse technology projects to the India market and some of the challenges you face. Are the challenges in India any more substantial to those that you would find in other countries? It sounded by what you were saying, that they are pretty substantial? Well, uh, there are other areas in the world that are, have uh, um, uh, tough climates as well uh, to grow crops. Um, uh, we recently built a, a project in Abu Dhabi that's really a tough uh, 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 and hot uh, uh, climate zone over there. Um, but India is... Um, uh, challenging, especially because of uh, lack of solid solid power resource. So, if you want to do something with electricity and you need a little bit of want, yeah, you, know, you you need a, a reliable power source, then that always gives immediately you know an, uh, a challenge to solve. Um, so, near major cities, um, that might be uh, uh, not that big of an issue, but yeah. Um, all these kind of projects uh, have their individual uh, challenges. Uh, is, is it the climate? Is the, the, the grid connections to get them in time? Um, yeah, so. Uh, we, we, uh, we'll come back to Jan in a minute, but I just wanted, we've had a question here online uh, about uh, polyhouse horticulture uh, in, uh, in India. And, and uh, uh, there's a very specific question to you, which is about how many hectares are there in, in India, and what's the growth rate? Can you can you help our questioner with that uh, an answer to that? Um, well, I, I thought in one of the slides of Jan, uh, he mentioned some figures uh, about uh, the current situation of polyhouses in India. But I know for sure that there are also a lot of polyhouses that are unused um, because the, 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 the small growers uh, were not capable, uh, did have experience to really benefit of, of uh, uh, growing crops in these kind of protected cultivation uh, uh, situation. Okay. Um, uh, okay, well, uh, let, let, let's switch to Jan. Perhaps the bandwidth is better now, but uh, um, can you answer that question, Jan, about the polyhouse uh, horticultural cultivation in, in India? What kind of size is it at the moment? Uh, quite small, I imagine. Yeah, we have uh, the figures we have is 25,000 total hectares. Hectares um, of protected cultivation, from which 5,000 um, protected are for vegetables. Uh, hydroponic cultivation is only 25 hectares, so that's really, really limited. Um, but uh, you see, of course, there's an influx also from, um, uh, from new companies starting in protected cultivation, and I think that only will increase. Um, but the real high tech. Uh, segment for glass houses is really limited and you can also ask yourself if you need um, um, uh, investment of those uh, kind of high high costs uh, for the Indian market since to already increase your uh, production per square meter. But there's there's I guess then then a more basic kind of level of investment which is still quite substantial about buying better seed uh, to produce better products and that's where you're having quite some success isn't it? Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, uh, we, we, of course, aim for disease uh, businesses um, for the specific, for the Indian uh, market. But, um, uh, Car carry on, Jan. I think we're just having a few bandwidth issues. At your end, so, uh, we are aiming for, yeah. Yeah, please carry on. We've just lost your, your video at the moment, but no problem. You carry on. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, so what uh, what the issue here is that uh, in, in India we are we are aiming for for different types of market segments. So for the open field as well as for the protected cultivation, and depending per area, we are looking for the right uh, solutions. 
uh, fluxing conditions, but also uh, related to the to the right genetics. I understand, uh, Pascal. Coming back to you uh, briefly, um, the, the the kind of particular um, skill set that the Netherlands can bring to um, uh, to to a country like India, it's there, there's a there's a certain how shall we say um, a, a coherence through various parts of the chain. Uh, with a with a big seed company like uh, like Swan, for example, with uh, your kind of advisory uh, uh, um, uh, and consultancy that you can bring, and, un and other parts of that, uh, and that's quite unique, isn't it, in the world of horticulture? The way that, as it were, it's almost an out of the box solution that the Netherlands can bring. Is, is that yeah, well, indeed, um, uh, the, the uh, and, and 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 if you look at the greenhouse, it's not only uh, the structure you're looking at, but also all the kinds of installations uh, inside. So, for example, for example, screening installation or irrigation uh, units uh, can be supplied from the Netherlands as well um, uh, as part of a, um, a higher level of control of growing your crops. That's what we from Holland promote uh, to try to produce as much as possible on a, on a small uh, footprint to be as efficient as possible. That's why, why our small country became one of the big uh, uh, exporters of, of horticultural products because we were able to to grow a lot on a short uh, short uh, space of land. Yeah. Now, Jan, uh, last last comment to you before I close the uh, uh, this this uh, year's um, conference. Um, you you said that you had I think it was fifty colleagues uh, now at Rajasthan in India, and I know that Rajasthan is a, a company that's operating hugely all over the world. Do you see India as uh, uh, as one of those countries where you're going to grow your operations substantially in future too? Yes, we certainly will. Uh, that's why we also invested in, in land uh, close to, to Bangalore. So we have opened our new uh, R&D facilities. So we also expect to uh, to focus more on uh, on Indian crops in terms of, uh, of, of breeding for the local market. Um, and uh, in, indeed, uh, so both on R and D side, as well as on on uh, uh, the extension of our product portfolio, but also in terms of the commercial side, we uh, we will grow also in the future for uh, for the Indian market. Wonderful. Well, we we look forward to following that story uh, very closely at Fresh Bodies India and and also through the pages of our our various magazines. Jan and Pascal, thank you very much indeed for your excellent contributions today. And thank you for thank taking you. part uh, at Fresh Body Cinema Live. All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Jan. Thank and you. Bye-bye.